Cool. So yeah, welcome. Um, what we're going to look at is an introduction to what mindfulness is and um, some mindfulness practices. We're actually going to go through a few and I'm going to give you some that are quite simple and you can take them away or practice straight away. And we're going to look at how mindfulness can help you manage your IBD. So first, a little bit about me. Um, I was born and raised in Ireland, came over seven years ago. Um, I don't come with subtitles, so if you can't understand me at any stage, just let me know and I can either slow down or repeat myself. I don't take offence to it, just let me know. Um, so I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease at 23 years old and that was nearly 13 years ago now. And I've always been super sensitive to stress. Um, and then I got diagnosed with Crohn's and it just became my biggest symptom trigger. So I used to try avoid situations and try avoid experiencing stress um, and that became very restrictive. Um, so it came to the point where I had to learn how to regulate it and understand my own personal stress response and take control back a little bit. So once I, the more I learn about it, the more I want to share it. So after 17 years working in accounts, I decided to retrain first as a life coach and then more niche as a health coach and then as a mindfulness facilitator. So yeah, it's my passion to help others learn what I've learned and get the same freedom. So, because I do, I strongly believe that, oh, we have one more. I strongly believe that with the right toolkit and the right support, you can change your whole life for the better. Um, yeah, and my passion is to help others to do the same with or without IBD. So, when we talk about our need for mindfulness, we have to address our busy minds. Our minds by nature, our minds by nature love planning, they love comparing, they love judging. They naturally wander from one thing to the next and that's okay that's the nature of the mind i've been talking now for a minute or two and i'm curious if you noticed if your mind has wandered off from what i'm saying if it hasn't i'd be worried about you so i want you for the next few minutes to notice when your attention is being taken away from what i'm saying and treat it like a little excitable puppy that keeps running off and just tug the leash back and bring your attention back to what I'm saying and just start to notice, notice the difference. So our busy minds, they stop paying close attention to what's going on around us in the present moment. They switch to autopilot mode and get stuck in it. So when we're learning something new for the first time, it takes our full attention and practice. And before long, we enter into autopilot. We don't need to pay as much attention. Um, just think of the many daily tasks that you do that you needed so much attention to learn at the start, but now you just don't even pay any attention, just like driving your car. That might have taken months to nail down, but now you just get into the car and you barely take any notice of what you're doing. So studies show we can have up to 12 to 15,000 thoughts a day. That's a lot of distractions in a day to tackle. So thinking is a great tool to have, but we forget to put it down at times and that can make it harder to unwind and to switch off. So why is that? So our mind is connected to our body. We feel what we think about. Our emotions are the physical representation of thoughts in our body. So we've all experienced a nervous belly when we're worried about something or our heart starts to race with excitement when we're looking forward to something. This works in reverse too. When we feel uneasy or tense in our bodies, it can cause us to have a worrisome state of mind. So it works like a feedback loop of information. So when we're focusing on our thinking minds and ignoring our body's reaction to it, it can leave our body in a state of tension, upset, or even run down and ill, which feeds back to our thoughts and state of mind. So our minds consciously or subconsciously can be used to distract us from the discomfort or the reality of our present moment situation. 
We have lots of mental distractions available to us these days and the scrolling on social media, television, Netflix, and so on. It's a very useful coping tool when we're overwhelmed and it's until it's the only one we're using and we don't know how to deal with the present moment. It can be tempting to ignore and try block out our bodies when we're dealing with IBD. Symptoms and body sensations can feel complicated and unmanageable, leaving us feeling frustrated, overwhelmed and unmotivated to make any changes. We may want to defy our disease by pushing our bodies beyond its limit. The key to regaining a calm and balanced feedback loop is understanding your own feedback loop, breaking the cycle by making changes and reconnecting your body and mind. So our stress response is a prime example of our body-mind connection. So what is it? Our stress response is a switch, a switch that gets turned on when we experience a real or a perceived threat. So a real threat is a tiger running towards us and our body gets fueled and pumped and prepares us to fight it or flee. Even two more people. And our perceived threat is just dependent on the person, what you find threatening. So I remember the first time I came across this concept, I went to a seminar um, back in Cork in Ireland, and it was um, a junior doctor that was doing research on, he was presenting his findings on the effects of lifestyle changes on IBD. And he brought up the term perceived stress. And he addressed that like most people presume stress is universal. It's that panicky feeling that you get before a job interview or um, a presentation or an exam in college. Um, and what we don't realize is we could have, we get triggered and have a stress response all throughout the day, depending on what we find stressful. And I remember sitting in the auditorium and it was probably one of the first times that switch flipped for me. And I suddenly started to become very aware of the tension and the stress in my body. As I sat in the auditorium and I noticed the worries and thoughts in my mind, all I kept thinking about was, I have to get a seat on the aisle in case I need to run to the toilet. I hope I don't need to run to the toilet before the break comes about because I don't want to make a fuss. I'm thinking how tired I was and how was I going to make it to the car and drive home afterwards. And the penny really dropped for me and I realized I'm in this state of mind most of the day, nearly every day. And that was a really big eye opener. I was like, I thought I only had to manage stress before those big life moments. So it just depends on the person. What some one person perceives as stressful may not be something that someone else finds stressful. So our stress response is very useful. If stress gets a really bad rep, it's seen as a negative thing, but that response is actually very useful. It keeps us safe and it's the kick up the butt we need sometimes to get stuff done. So it's a physical, emotional and a mental response. So when you think about it, when we panic or get stressed out, we tend to get a tight chest, our breathing gets quite shallow, um, our hearts start to race, our blood flow uh, prioritizes the blood to our muscles so we can get prepared to fight or flee. And our digestion slows down, the blood flow stops going to our digestion and prioritizes it to our muscles. When we are safe from a threat, that switch response switches off to calm down and we physically calm down in our bodies. This is a very useful response when we are in physical danger and in need to fight or flee, fight or flee. But these days, our busy minds can make up all sorts of what if scenarios that we can't fight or flee. So they're very hard to switch off from. We end up staying switched on most of the time and it makes it harder to switch off. One thing we can do to kickstart our calm switch is use the breath as an anchor to ground us and switch off that stress response. Oh, we've one in the waiting room. He's joining in there now. So 
the breath, the short breath that we get and the tight chest that we get, that's one of the physical symptoms that we actually have control of. You can't control your heart rate. You can't control the blood flow going to your muscles and tensing up, but you can control your breath. So I want you to do a little exercise with you for Kane. Um, it's basically a really good go-to in any situation that you're in that you don't feel you have control of and you can feel the tension building up in your body and you can feel it getting hot. So if you just take a minute and we're going to try to slow down your breathing. So the goal is to check in where your breath is at, get a bit comfortable in your seat. And if you sit up straight and drop down your shoulders, it gives a clear passageway to breathe deep. And the goal is there's lots of different exercises you can do. There's lots of different counts you can do. Um, but the goal really is to have an exhale that's longer than your inhale and have a pause in between both. So we're going to take a minute and we're going to look at meeting your breath where it's at and starting with a long exhale. You can put your hands at the end of your rib cage, that's where your diaphragm is. And that's the part that you want to feel going in and out when you fill your lungs and empty it. So if we start by exhaling. If you pause for four and hold your breath. And then breathe in slowly for six or whatever is comfortable. Hold your breath for four. And breathe out slowly for eight. We do that again. Breathe in. Hold. And breathe out. Hold. And breathe in. Hold and breathe out. And one more time. So we don't force the breath, we meet it where it's at and we just take that pace and slow it down gradually. And what we're doing is we're, A, we're checking in to see where the breath, the breath can tell us how stressed we are, how wound up we are, if it's a short breath, if we're tight in the chest. And what we're doing is we're gradually guiding our bodies to slow down and switch that switch from stress on to calm on. It's a great tool to use when you're out and about rushing around and you want to calm down your whole system before that urgency to use the bathroom kicks in. So part of that urgency response is the stress of not finding the bathroom, obviously. So by frantically searching, we're fueling that stress response. So with the breathing, that's the part we can learn to manage. Now it is what it is, sometimes you soil yourself sometimes you don't make it and sometimes it just is what it is but we can start to train our response because it's happened so many times it becomes automatic it becomes the automatic thing we worry about when we're out and about if we're already feeling a bit uneasy um but it's the thing that we can pause and start to manage is that frantic feeling it's very scary because you know that it's it's, it's one of those perceived threats so there's nothing running towards you. There's nothing real that's going to harm you. But the perceived threat is I'm going to be embarrassed if I soil myself. And it's causing a stress response on top of the urgency that you're feeling. So what we can do is manage that with the breath. So it's a good one to have in your back pocket if you're feeling vulnerable and in the middle of nowhere and you just can't access a bathroom. Um, it's good to give it a go. It, it trains your system to break that pattern of going, oh, no, I can't find the bathroom and go. 
So the overall aim with the stress response is not to avoid stress like I used to do. It's the aim is to build resilience. So it's all about introducing enough stress into your comfort zone, pushing you out of your comfort zone so that you would, you learn to adapt to that stress. And then suddenly your comfort zone gets that little bit bigger rather than launching yourself out of your comfort zone, getting overwhelmed and then finding it very hard to switch off from it. So this helps us to work smarter as well. So So mindfulness is paying attention to the present moment. So if we look at the difference between our man and his dog, the man is out and about, he's surrounded by trees, he's out with his dog, but his mind is so busy, he can't even see what's around him. Versus the poor little dog that just wants to go for a walk with his owner and he's completely present and just wants to enjoy his day. So that's the difference between a full mind versus being completely mindful to what's going on around you. That's probably the most basic way of looking at it. Mindfulness is not a new concept. It's been practiced for thousands of years in Eastern countries through Hinduism, Buddhism, yoga, and meditation. John Kabat-Zinn is one of the first people to introduce mindfulness to the Western world back in 1979. In 94, he defined it as paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and not judgmentally. This is John Kabat in there with his little telescope and his little meditation thing. So he worked as a microbiologist at the University of Massachusetts Medical School and started a modest eight week program called Mindfulness Based Stress Reduction. He invited the patients of the hospital to take some time out for self-care down in the hospital basement. For more than 40 years, mindfulness-based stress reduction, the program he created, is taught all over the world and has become the gold standard for applying mindfulness to stresses of everyday life and for researching whether mindfulness practice can improve mental or physical health. So that's our main man there. So how do we pay attention to the present moment? The first step is becoming aware of our biggest distraction, that's our thoughts. Like we said, our mind naturally wanders. Automatic thoughts enter our mind, we don't have control over them. They're like waves that come in one after another. This can become very overwhelming if we're stuck in a stress response for long periods of time and get stuck in overthinking loops. The goal isn't to try to stop the waves of thought, it's to go under the water where it's calm and observe the thoughts from a distance. We become the observer of the thoughts and separate from that constant commentary of thinking. We can't control that initial automatic thought that comes into our mind, but we can control, we can manage, we can learn to manage the subsequent thoughts that come after that automatic thought. So the meaning we attach to a thought that comes into our mind. So the next exercise I'm going to invite you to do is a breathing meditation to focus on your breath. It's going to take about one minute. So if you want to sit up straight, I can't see any of you. So if you, any of you have any issues or anything, you can just let me know in the chat. But if you want to sit up straight and drop your shoulders down, your feet can be flat on the floor. And close your eyes or lower your gaze. We're going to focus your attention on your breath as it flows in and out of your body. Stay in touch with the different sensations of each in-breath and each out-breath. Observe the breath without looking for anything special to happen. There's no need to alter your breathing in any way. After a while, your mind may wander. When you notice this, gently bring your attention back to your breath without giving yourself a hard time. 
the act of realizing that your mind has wandered and bringing your attention back without criticizing yourself is central to the practice of mindfulness meditation. Your mind may eventually become calm like a still pond, or it may not. Even if you get a sense of absolute stillness, it may only be fleeting. If you feel angry or exasperated, notice that this may be fleeting too. Whatever happens, just allow it to be as it is. I'm going to give it another 30 seconds. So try focus on your breath in and your breath out. When you're ready, you can open your eyes. You can let me know later how you get on. So the next step is becoming aware of our emotions. So when we're stressed, wound up, holding on to our emotions for a while it doesn't take much to get upset overreact or sometimes explode think of emotions like a snow globe or snow in the snow globe when we get upset the snow globe shakes the snow scrambles frantically our aim with mindfulness is to pause when we feel an emotional reaction coming up we take a step back we settle and we choose the response to the incident just like the snow in the globe, emotions will naturally settle if we don't act upon them immediately. We want to choose how we want to respond, not just how we react. Thank you. Thank you. So we're not talking about, we're not aiming for toxic positivity and trying to be happy all the time. Quite the opposite. We get triggered by all types of emotions all day. They will come and they will go naturally. The problem arises when they might feel uncomfortable or we judge ourselves or others judge us for feeling a certain way. Instead of validating and accepting how we feel, we avoid and bury our emotions. That's when they get stuck in the body as uneasiness and tension. So the next exercise that we're gonna do for the next few minutes is bringing our attention to physical sensations of our body. So we're gonna do a body scan. If you want, I invite you to make yourself comfortable. You can either stay sitting up straight or you can lay down, it's up to yourself. If sitting up, keep your back straight and drop your shoulders down, place your hands on your lap. If you're lying down, keep your legs uncrossed, falling away from your body. Arms by your side, slightly away from your body. You might want to grab a blanket or something if you get if you need to keep warm. So you may find it helpful to close your eyes, but do feel free to keep them open if you prefer, or to open them at any time during the meditation if you feel you're falling asleep. So take a few moments to bring awareness to the physical sensations in your body, especially to those of touch or pressure where your body makes contact with whatever you're lying or you're sitting on. A 
allow yourself to sink into it. Now focus your attention on your feet, starting with your toes. We don't normally pay attention to our toes unless we stub them. We want to expand the spotlight of attention so it takes in the soles of our feet, the heels and the top of our feet. Until you're attending to any and all of the physical sensations you become aware of in both feet, moment to moment. Spend a few moments attending to the feet in this way, noticing how sensations arise and dissolve in awareness. If there are no sensations in this region of the body, simply register a blank. This is perfectly fine. You're not trying to make situation, sensations happen. You're simply registering what is already there when you pay attention. Now expand your attention to take in the rest of both legs for a few moments. Then the torso from the pelvis and hips up to the shoulders. And the left arm, the right arm, the neck, and all over your head. When you notice your awareness is not on your body sensations, Congratulate yourself. You have already woken up enough to know and are aware of the experience in the present moment. The mind will wander over and over again. So each time, remember the aim is simply to note where the mind has been and then gently escort your attention back to your body sensations. Spend a minute resting in the awareness of your whole body. See if it's possible to allow your body and its sensations to just be as you find them. Explore how it is to let go of the tendency to want things to be a certain way. Even one brief moment of seeing how things are without wanting to change anything can be profoundly nourishing. When you're ready, you can open your eyes, start to wriggle your fingers on your toes. So one way to break these overthinking, uneasy cycles is paying attention to and adjust our attitude. The mind could be naturally, the mind can naturally be quite critical, closed off to right or wrong, or black and white thinking. We try to fix situations and problem solve. By being mindful of this attitude, we can break the cycle. So instead we become, we come at situations with open curiosity, non-judgment, acceptance and compassion. Instead of getting stressed over the things we can't change, we accept them and focus on the things we can change. So if we feel a certain way, we don't judge ourselves for feeling that way and hold on to it. 
and try block it out. We notice it, we validate it, accept it. Be kind to ourselves and just leave it pass. So here's a few mindfulness practices. We've already looked at the body scan and breathing meditation and a breathing exercise to slow down our breath. Here are a few more you can implement in your day to day. So the first one is activating your five senses. By engaging your five senses, you get out of your busy mind and back into your body, into the present moment. So one exercise you can do is list five things you can say four things you can hear, three things you can touch, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. What you're doing is making yourself more aware of your senses rather than your constant stream of thoughts. Another good one is submerging yourself in cold water. It's a great way of just activating your senses and distracting you from your mind. Another one is mindful walking. Next time you go for a walk, pay close attention to all the aspects of the movement. Notice your muscles tense and release. Notice your weight shift from one foot to the other. Notice the breeze on your skin and the sounds and smells around you. Journaling is a great tool to use to raise your awareness of thoughts and emotions. By writing them down, you've actively filed them down in magnitude. It gives you the opportunity to step back and review from a different perspective. You can apply mindfulness to every task you do. Just fully engage your attention in the task and kindly guide any distracting thoughts away. So why do we need to practice? We have a use it or lose it brain. When we learn or do something for the first time, neurons, that were previously unconnected, wired together in new neural pathways. But when we do things repeatedly, when we practice them, these pathways get stronger and stronger. So think of it like walking through a field of tall grass. It takes extra effort to make those dents in the grass at first. But once you've walked over and back multiple times, you've created well-defined pathways requiring minimum effort to get through. It also means that just because you've gotten used to certain ways of thinking and behaving doesn't mean you can't change them. You can teach an old dog new tricks. We call this neuroplasticity. By setting aside short slots of time throughout the day to practice mindfulness, we can begin to break old ways of thinking and create new ones. So the big question, how can mindfulness help us manage IBD? The benefits of mindfulness mindfulness are vast and depend on what the individual needs relief from and how committed they are to achieving it. From mental clarity, emotional regulation, reduced stress, anxiety and depression, better quality of sleep and so on. Being able to pay more attention to our present moment, getting out of our heads and into our bodies is so important when we want to learn how to manage our IBD. Living with IBD gives us more uncertainty and obstacles to manage before we even get out of bed in the morning compared to the average person. So it's kind of vital we learn how to manage it. So the first way you can help is symptom management. When you have a body that's in a chronic state of disease or uneasiness, A, it makes you more sensitive to a stress response, and B, it makes it more important to regulate and manage that stress response. By making ourselves more aware of our body sensations from moment to moment, we can gain valid information about what behaviours trigger our symptoms. By being more aware of those triggers and less emotionally reactive, we can make mindful choices about how we behave and act less out of impulse, like when we need to choose what we eat or how we prioritise movement and rest. So the next one technically falls under the category of symptom management, but I found this research so fascinating. So if we take, if we can't prevent, we actually can't prevent physical gain. And again, it's the body's way of letting us know when something is wrong. So we don't really want to, to dismiss that message. When we stress about or attach meaning to that pain, we create emotional suffering and the volume of that pain intensifies. The third picture here is a scene from the 1979 movie, Aliens. 
Dan O'Bannon, one of the writers for Aliens the Movie, had Crohn's disease. He said he based his depiction of the alien in the tummy on the pain he felt with Crohn's. It's what he visualized. I think we can all relate to that at some point or another. So mindfulness helps us turn that volume down on the pain intensity so we can experience less pain and suffering and break that stress cycle pain causes. So the third way mindfulness can help IBD is it can help us manage our mindset. Mindsets are a set of beliefs, thoughts and behaviours. They become automatic, but once we're aware of them and we can review them and change them, they can no longer. Oh, once we become aware of them, we can review them and change them. If they no longer serve us by managing our mindset, we can get some control back on how we respond to situations. We can shift from a fixed to a growth mindset. Oh. A fixed mindset believes we're stuck in a situation we're in. We don't have the power to change anything and it leaves us feeling power, powerless and helpless. A growth mindset is open to possibility. We're limited by what we, we're only limited by what we know. So if I don't know something, it's because I haven't learned it yet. And that's something I can change. The same goes for our medical system. It's a very powerful tool that we have access to, but they are limited by what they know and the resources that they have access to. Understanding our behavior and knowing our why helps us break unhelpful habits. Mindfulness helps be mindful about eating, movement, sleep, and other lifestyle choices that can help IBD. Mindfulness helps us manage our adaptability to change and deal with uncertainty. And there can be a lot of uncertainty living with a chronic illness. So number four is an improved sense of self. Mindfulness helps us get a sense of who we are without disease. By helping us regulate emotions, cope better, build independence, a sense and sense of control, we can build our self-confidence, self-esteem and self-acceptance. Number five is creating a support network. Being connected to others has proven health benefits. Dan Butner is an explorer and journalist for the National Geographic. Throughout his travels, he discovered the five places in the world dubbed the Blue Zones hotspots, where people live the longest, healthiest lives. Their populations live to 100 years old more often than anywhere else in the world. And the common factor in these people is their sense of community and purpose. Mindfulness helps us connect with others more easily. To connect with others, we need to be able to pay attention and listen actively. When we have a strong sense of self, we can create healthier connections with others. If we haven't accepted ourselves because we may feel like a burden, we struggle to set boundaries and assert our needs in relationships. That leaves us highly vulnerable to making unhealthy connections and our, our vibe attracts our tribe. Finally, number six is improved quality of life. There was a study done in Melbourne, the University of Melbourne, in 2016 to analyze the effects of mindfulness on the quality of life for IBD patients. Although it was a small group of 60, the findings show that after an eight week mindfulness based stress reduction training course, those patients reportedly significant, reported significantly greater improvements in anxiety, quality of life and mindfulness at the end of the eight weeks and maintained it at six weeks after intervention when they were checked in on. This is one of my favorite quotes and constant reminders. I used to feel horrendously guilty about taking time out for myself or canceling plans and leaving people down. But if you don't take time for your wellness, you'll have to make time for your illness. Our busy minds will convince us that taking time out for ourselves is selfish and a waste of time. But there's so much opportunity to relieve us of a lot of pain and suffering. We just need to learn how to pay attention. So I've listed some of my resources here if you want to take a look. I have a little hub of content that I'm trying to build and it's to educate people on how to build their own mindfulness practice. If you want to email me, I know this is being recorded, but if you want to email me, I can send you the meditations that we did this evening. 
and I can send them out over the next week. And I'm putting together a new online mindfulness course at the moment. If that's something you're keen to try, you can email me as well on contact at rachelavoy.com. Just want to thank you. Thank you for joining in. I hope it was helpful in some way. And if you have any questions, you can ask now, or if you're too shy, you can email me later on contact at rachelavoy.com.